Why don't you stand and we'll sing?
I was standing there wondering why the baseball kept getting bigger. And then it hit me. Thanks for joining us today. You're listening to Laugh Again with Phil Calloway. This summer, we experienced a wasp infestation at the Calloway house. I waged war on four nests in our yard each time at night after the critters were tucked in bed. The morning after the fourth campaign, I went to admire my handiwork and discovered I'd failed. They were swarming. One of them, tired of me, I suppose, decided to practice some acupuncture on my left hand. Ooh. I don't deal with pain quietly, so I hopped in circles on one foot, yelling, Dog biscuits! My mother's wasp sting cure was to rub rhubarb juice on it, give us a rhubarb stalk and sugar to dip it in. The rhubarb didn't help the sting, but the sugar helped us forget it. It wasn't a remedy at all. It was a diversion. The next morning, my left hand had ballooned like a puffer fish. It looked like I was holding a puppet. I could have entertained small children for hours. Sadly, I could not grip a vacuum cleaner or hold a broom or load the dishwasher. Household chores were out. It was such a trial. When I showed my Facebook friends a picture of my puffer fish, the cures came rapidly. Mud, lanocaine, antibiotics, probiotics, antihistamines, a cut potato. You rub it on the wound. A copper penny to neutralize the venom. Tiger balm, plantain leaves. That's a weed. Baking soda, liquid honey, apple cider vinegar, butter, not margarine, that's very important. Absorbing horse liniment. Really? An ice pack in a sock. Vicks Vapor Rub. Joan said toothpaste works. So I followed that advice very carefully. I brushed my teeth eight times. It didn't help. <laughs> I told my friends I had combined their remedies in a blender and applied them in a poultice. The hand was now twice the size. Some responded with good humor. Teresa said, sprinkle cayenne pepper in your eyes. You'll forget all about the sting. <laughs> Larry recommended an ancient cure. Go to the nearest farm and find a fresh cow pie. Rub it on the affected hand and your cheeks and neck. I did not try this. See a doctor immediately, someone advised. The more wasp stings you get, the more allergic you become. So I kept an eye on it. Thankfully, I don't deal with anaphylactic issues like a friend of mine. And that's just the beginning of the things I have to be thankful for after this wasp sting. Here are a few. Though unable to hold a mop for household chores, I was somehow able to grip a golf club. And I'm able to hold an ice cream cone too. Miraculous. I'm thankful it was a wasp, not a bullet ant. Bullet ants are found in Nicaragua and Paraguay. They're about an inch long and can sting you over and over, affecting your central nervous system and resulting in temporary paralysis. I'm thankful that, as my mother told me when I was a kid, getting stung is a good thing, son. It will help with arthritis. That was a strange way to comfort a five-year-old, but it helps to think of it now. I'm thankful for friends who helped me laugh. One, who must have just watched an old western, said, Slice it open with your hunting knife and suck the venom out. <laughs> Likely the nicest thing someone said to me was, I'm sorry, I got stung twice this summer. Can I stop by and drink some ice-cold lemonade with you? There's nothing quite like friends who've been there. Our verse of the day comes from 2 Corinthians 1, All praise to God, the source of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Is there someone you can comfort today? Be there for them. My friend and I had some good laughs over lemonade, and he gave me a helpful hint for attacking the next wasp nest. Wear gloves. And I plan to, just as soon as I can get one on over this puppet on my left hand. Stories of the Bible, Daniel in the Lion's Den. This is Daniel, oh, hey. who was a Jewish man who was taken to Babylon when he was very young. Mm -hmm. Daniel loved God and followed God's rules. He talked to God three times a day and asked God for help often. Daniel served in the Babylonian king's court for many years. Yeah, I know him. And under many kings. Hey, Daniel. Daniel always proved himself to be more capable than all the other court officials. I hear you. Thanks. Wow, well, time. Daniel was serving under King Darius, and because of his great abilities, the king made plans to place him in charge of the entire empire. Wow, okay. The other court officials searched for some fault in Daniel, 
but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. The court officials realized the only way to get at Daniel would be to challenge his faith. Come on! So they went to King Darius. <laughs> Excuse me, Your Majesty. And advised him to make a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone except King Darius will be thrown into the lion's den. I like it. King Darius signed this law, and once a Babylonian king signed a law, it could not be overruled. When Daniel learned of this law, he went home and knelt down, as he always did, to pray in his room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he always had done, giving thanks to God and asking for his help. The officials went to Daniel's house and found him praying. Gotcha! They went to the king and reminded him of the law. I remember. Well... Then they said that Daniel had been found praying to God three times a day. What? When the king heard this, he was very upset. Get over here. And he spent the whole day trying to think of a way to save Daniel. Wait, what? By that evening, the court officials came back to the king <coughs> and reminded him that no law signed by the Babylonian king could be overruled. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. The king said to him, May your God, who you serve faithfully, rescue you. Then the lion's den was sealed shut with Daniel inside. The king spent the night fasting and couldn't sleep. Then very early in the morning, the king hurried to the lion's den. He called out, Hey Daniel! Was your God able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, Long live the king! My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be taken out of the lion's den. Then the king ordered the men who had schemed against Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den as punishment. Daniel was safe. There was not a scratch on him, for he trusted in God. Hi guys, it's me Gus! I'm so excited to draw with you today because we are drawing a very brave man named Daniel. Let's do it! First, draw a short little line in the middle of your paper. Then a line going down on the right side, like this. On the other side, draw another line going down, but add a short line out to the left, like this. Now connect these two lines here with a curved line across. Yeah, a nose! Now let's do circles on either side of the nose for eyes. Draw two little circles inside those ones too, like this. Now color them in. Okay, now go up above his eye on this side and draw a long line going down that kind of starts to curve in at the bottom. And we'll do another curved line on the other side, like this. This one curves in, then out. Like that. Connect those lines at the bottom with a straight line across. Yep. Head back up to the nose and draw a line across for his beard. But don't draw through the nose! Daniel has a super cool mustache, so let's draw some lines that look like leaves going down from his nose like this. And a little smile underneath. Now let's add some curly hair across the bottom of his hair. Draw a few curly swirls like this. Let's do a little backward C shape here. At the top right up here, we're gonna draw a rectangle for his hat. Let's add some more hair now. On this side of his hat, let's draw some big raindrop shapes like this. 
And then even bigger ones over here on the left! Now we just need some straight lines above his eyes. Here! And here to make some eyebrows! And guess what? We did it! Thanks for drawing Daniel with me today, friends! <laughs> See ya! at Cornerstone Free Methodist Church on this first Sunday in September 2021. Today I would like for us to look together at Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is a moving graphic 
and really a pathetic picture of a group of captives who are being forced to survive in a foreign land, living in a totally different environment from the homeland, different customs, different languages, different surroundings, and under the bondage of different allegiances and expectations. These captives longed for the good old days when life was good and they had freedom and were able to celebrate and rejoice. But now, by the rivers of Babylon, there they sat down and there they wept when they remembered Zion. Listen to their woebegone words. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for, you see, our captors asked us for songs. Those who were tormenting us wanted us to be full of mirth, and they jested, sing to us some of the old songs from back home. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the question that Boney M made popular a few years ago in one of her songs boomed from their own laments. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Unfortunately, we see images of this same kind of situation or hear of or read about reports of this kind of thing in our news media almost every day. I mean, there is so much suffering by people being mistreated and victimized in our world all around the world. Right here at home, there are groups with a history of ethnic mistreatment, and they still struggle with emotional captivity over what has happened in the past and what holds them back in the present. We are now almost two years into a pandemic, and our world is no longer the same. There are different expectations and almost daily new uncertainties. And we wonder if things will ever be the same again. Or maybe for some of us, it is just that the years have gone by and we have moved a long way from the time when we thought we had the world by the tail, when we had all the answers, or more likely when we didn't think much about the questions. And we are now captive to our own uncertainties. Or we're still, we are, are still grasping, we feel hedged in by our failures, by our, lack to, uh, by our lack of success or accomplishment. We do see the log in our own eye, and it blurs our vision for the future. I am presently reading a book entitled Elderhood, where the author, doctor, uh, opens a, a more positive view of the sunset of life that begins usually when we move into our 80s. But this too is a strange land, uh, since it is new territory and we have to figure out where we are and, and what our new surroundings mean. So let's listen to the words of the psalm uh, as we try to imagine the picture of these captives. This is how it goes. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. It's an awful picture, isn't it? 
I mean, both the situation that they are in and the bitter attitude that they have against their captors. And so I want us this morning, as much as we can, to imagine the context of this psalm. I mean, let's put ourselves into it as much as we can. Now, I don't know your stories, but I expect for some of us, this will be easier than for others. Maybe it's dangerously close to our own experience on some level. But let's sit back and imagine. Your memories go back to good times of safety and security and familiar surroundings with friends and families. It is the homeland. But you have been taken captive, and you are in a foreign land. Different customs, different people, a different language, and, and you are forcefully or circumstantially disconnected from those things that you value so highly. On top of that, your captors are demanding that you be joyful, and especially they are asking that you sing. Sing one of the old songs from back home. So there you are, sitting by the river for a moment's rest, a little reprieve in the journey, but the harps that once provided such joyful music you have hung up on the willow branches, and the last thing you want to do is to entertain your captors with the music that belongs to you and your homeland. That music and those songs are, are sacred, and it would be inappropriate to use them to entertain a group of captors who have no appreciation of the connection that they have to your spirit or the devotion and relationship with God that they describe. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's the question we ask this morning. And as we look at Psalm 137, I think there are some great truths that apply even to where we live today. First of all, we can sing the Lord's song because we have a song to sing. I mean, the Lord gives us a song of gladness and freedom. The psalmist says in another place, sing unto the Lord a new song. And, you know, when we invite and allow God to move into our lives, we do have a new song to sing. It is a good song. It is a song of forgiveness and deliverance from our sinfulness. It is a song of provision and protection. I mean, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. We have a song to sing. It's a song of many stanzas in that it stays new and fresh in all the changes and challenges of life. It is a good and joyful song. And we are always included in the song. For you see, this song expresses the truth of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, which say, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now, friends, I have to admit that there are times in life when it is easier than others to sing the Lord's song. Maybe it's Sunday morning in church like today, when for brief moments we can lay aside the struggles and challenges that have captured us during the week. For now, we can forget about what is still ahead of us in our work or what the next medical appointment may reveal. And we join with others in a congregation to sing the Lord's song. Uh, we call this the song of worship and community. 
Or maybe it's when we can get away from the phones and other demands uh, during a hike on gorgeous mountain trails or through the woods. Or maybe on a canoe trip in the, in the rugged northern rivers. Or sitting in a lawn chair and watching the sunset over a tranquil prairie lake. Here we sing the song of solitude, tranquility, and silence. Maybe it's those rare moments when we stare mesmerized by the living flames that slowly consume the logs in the fireplace or at a fireside. This is the song of reflection. For others, it may be times of intense activity when we are like what Paul Jones says, inebriated by living. This is a song of activity and engagement. Yes, friends, there are times, many times, when it is easy to sing the Lord's song. Life is good, stress is low, and we tune our harps and sing the Lord's song. But what about the other times? The times when we are so consumed by all the stuff around us. The times when we are lonely and feeling isolated from friends and family. The times when we experience just how unfair life can be. Or times when we are overwhelmed by the awful tragedies in our world, uh, the kind of tragedy that, that shakes us all and, and stuns a community. Then there are those times when we are running hard just to keep up to the demands that changes have brought into our lives, like starting a new job or career, like adjusting to the loss of a partner, like dealing with the chronic and, and or terminal illness. And so I guess the question is, do we only sing the Lord's song when we feel like it? You know, there's a Southern Gospel song, and the words go like this. Uh, Life is easy when you're up on the mountain, and you've got peace of mind like you've never known, but then things change, and you're down in the valley, don't lose hope, for you are never alone. And then it goes on to say in the chorus, For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God of the bad times. And the God of the day is still God in the night. Yes, we do have a song to sing no matter what the circumstances of life might be. But I notice secondly, in this uh, psalm, in a real sense, we are all captives in a foreign land. Uh, th th there are many scenarios. Some of us are what Leonard Sweet calls immigrants to the culture. Uh, Sweet identified a clear line in the sand a while back, he observed that if we were born before 1962, we are immigrants to the culture that we are now a part of. In other words, and, and more generally, things have, uh, or things are changing so fast that the culture we were born into is foreign to the culture we now inhabit. Now, I know for many in younger generations, change is welcomed. I mean, you embrace it. You are bored if it doesn't happen fast enough. But for us older guys, change can be overwhelming. Uh, we, we can feel caught in it and it's in its effects. And so, young or older, here are the facts of the case. Anytime we are struggling to figure out our surroundings, it is hard to sing the Lord's song. I mean, sometimes we feel captive to the circumstances of our lives, whether it is our employment, our family, changes in our family, uh, church, education, or whatever. 
we look back on better days and when we try to look forward we we don't see much that would lighten the spirit for example during a transitional time such as you are experiencing now there, there are lots of questions and and lots of uncertainties even about processes and outcomes things that can rob us of joy and move us into unknowns we have a need for laughter but how can we be joyful how can we sing the lord's song in this strange land of uncertainty we may be captives to our own vision and live in this strange land of no direction or purpose and how can we sing the lord's song in that strange land Without a vision, the people perish, the Bible says. But there are times when we are just trying to find our way. Yes, there are lots of things, circumstances and all, that cause us to hang up our hearts, harps on the willow branches and sit in depression by the rivers of Babylon. But here's the third uh, observation or question that I have. What happens when we don't sing the Lord's song? Well, two or three things. First of all, we don't use the gifts that the Lord has given us. Here in this psalm, they hung up their harps on the willow branches. Now that intrigues me. They were musicians. I mean, they carried their harps with them. At a time when they were making uh, their way of escape, when all that they could take with them were the things that they could carry, they brought along their harps, their musical instruments. But now, in the sadness of their circumstances, or should I say, in their choice to be sad and angry in the circumstances they were in, they hung them up while they dangled their feet in the waters of Babylon. You know, there isn't much singing at a pity party, is there? I mean, if anyone is there with the gift of music, we don't need them. I mean, there's no place for them to sing their song or use their gifts. When we refuse to sing the Lord's song, we can easily live in the atmosphere of what I call a very pious spirituality of the past. Can't you hear the pious drip of these words. Listen as I read them. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Over the years, I've seen and heard people who are constantly trying to recapture the glory of the past. But you know what? In our personal lives or in the church, if we are constantly looking to the past, uh, we just get dull and boring. You see, most of us don't have enough momentum from the past to keep us up to speed in the present. And even good ideas, even effective methods, uh, even things that have worked well in the past have their day in the sun, but eventually the best before date expires and, and we must come up with new ideas and, and new ways or we get dusty and stale. And by the way, I think we are living at such a time when it is time to, to imagine what we could do differently in the life of the church to be effective in ministry in our neighborhoods. But here's the worst part when we don't sing the Lord's song. Uh, and that is that we can develop an ugly attitude toward those around us. Before we read the last three verses of this psalm, it feels like we need to post a warning. And the warning would read, The following material contains graphic scenes and may be offensive to some audience. Or maybe we should read, and should be offensive to everyone. 
reader discretion required. But these verses are in the Bible. And I think they're there because they depict what can happen to us when we sit by the rivers of ba Babylon and refuse to sing the Lord's song. Not only do we become angry, we start seeking revenge. A and that's ugly and destructive to the soul. W. Paul Jones, uh, who I mentioned just a bit earlier, has written a book entitled Teaching the Dead Bird to Sing. Jones began his journey as a Protestant in the poverty Appalachia, of Appalachia. Uh, he, learned, he earned degrees from Yale, taught at Princeton, became a Protestant minister, served as a chaplain for the Black Panthers, and was later ordained as a Catholic priest. But through it all, by his own testimony, his own admission, he said life was empty and not satisfying. He called himself a functional atheist. But determined to have it out with God, he shares his deepest longing. He said, I desperately want to believe, to believe that God is the one who has embedded the question that characterizes my curiosity. And that question is why. He had the why question all the time. Well, he made some wonderful discoveries. And among them is that he has a spiritual song to sing and in a way that is consistent with who he is. He says, I now know who I am. My soul thirsts for a spirituality befitting a poet inebriated by living. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's the question this morning. And you know what? If we can go out from here and figure out even some of the answer to that question, even a little bit, and actually start to sing the song, we will truly be the church. We will, sure, we will surely be the community of faith living fully in the world that we are a part of. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank you that you have placed within us a song, a song of forgiveness and deliverance, a song of the gospel that we can sing wherever we are, no matter what the circumstances of our lives may be, no matter what we're going through. You have given us a beautiful song. May we sing it with joy and gladness. In Jesus' name.